is Sandra Brower, and I'm the program lead for the Bachelor of Arts Theology and Ministry at Cliff College. At Cliff, we're committed to theology and ministry for the real world in word and spirit. I've been thinking in these past few weeks about what that might mean to someone who's considering starting a theology degree. You might think now is a strange time to uh, start anything new, and I think we're all feeling a little bit like that. Uh, these past few weeks, I've had much more time to spend in my garden, which you can see behind me. And this year, more than any, I've been awakened to the miracle of spring in a new way. The whole world is in global lockdown, but that just can't stop nature. And it reminded me of something we like to say at Cliff, that theology and ministry never stops. It just changes shape. Just today, I've been planting some seeds, uh, and over the next few weeks, I will uh, tend them faithfully in hopes that in a month or so, I'll have a crop of lettuce to harvest. Made me wonder if God is planting any seeds in your life right now, and maybe one of them is a desire to dig deeper into scripture or to probe intentionally uh, into the theological issues and questions that are really pertinent for our world today and certainly in our world right now. You know, we're open uh, and we're accepting applications for September right now. Uh, we may be adapting to a new normal, uh, but we will be open. And I'd like you to consider joining us. We'd love to welcome you to our community and to help you cultivate the seeds that God might be planting in your life right now. Join us and with us, commit to theology and ministry for the real world today. Go. Hi, my name's Cathy Thacker and I work at Cliff College. Up until last year I was part of the leadership team for Festival and it was my great privilege to help to put it together for seven years. I'm going to really miss not being there this year. I think there's two great things about Festival. One of them is that we have always tried really hard to make it a festival that is for all ages. We've tried to make sure that there is something for everyone and I think on the whole that we have achieved this. Obviously there's always more that can be done and we're improving it year on year but I think that that is a really great, unique, distinct thing. And the second thing that I uh, really love about Festival is the opportunities that we've been able to give the students over the years. We've given them opportunities to lead worship in the main tent, to lead the youth venues, to lead the children's venues, to serve. And I think that we have created men and women who will be able to serve the Kingdom of God better because of the opportunities that they have had at Festival over the years. I really hope that you enjoy Festival at Home this year. Normally you'd find me behind the desk uh, at reception at Festival and this year of course we're unable to do that but I thought I would say hello anyway hope that you're all doing well I'm sad not to be able to see all the faces as people arrive answer all your questions make sure that your time at festival is an enjoyable one but hopefully you know what time dinner is going to be served and um, you know where your toilets are and you won't have to queue for showers if you're uh, watching from home this year so I hope that you are having a blessed time you're encouraged by this time as festival at home and uh, I also want to say a special hello uh, and a big miss you to Enid and Ivor as well. So enjoy the rest of Festival at Home and I'll be tuning in alongside you and hopefully we will catch up soon. Hello, I'm Ian White and I'm the senior tutor of the college and from a very blowy garden in Sheffield, I have two things linked to Cliff College just behind me and to Cliff College anniversary celebration that became Cliff College Festival. Anybody recognise these from Cliff College Terrace many, many years ago when we used to sit outside, not under canvas, with our brollies up when it rained and listen to the good news of Jesus? Hello. I'm Becky. My name's Ben. I'm Nathan. 
I study maths and physics at Warwick University. I'm a student, I'm studying theology and youth work at um, Regents Bible College. I'm a uni student from Florida. I'm studying international business. So I'm doing this road trip with Nathan and Ben. We're travelling around the UK, we're meeting people from a whole different range of perspectives who um, are within the Methodist tradition. Talking about a range of challenging issues. I feel like we just don't chat about them in church enough. I've got these questions about what I believe. So anyone who's just looking to find out more, this should be really helpful. It's going to be one heck of a ride. My name's Tim Baker and I'm the Churches and Volunteers Manager at All We Can. And it's been my privilege to be at Cliff Festival many times over the last few years, always in my role as part of the All We Can team. So it's been my pleasure to lead seminars and to have lots of really good conversations in the marketplace. And it's those conversations in the marketplace that will always be my endearing memories of Cliff Festival. Brilliant conversations about people's discipleship, about people's spiritual growth, times of prayer, times where we've learned and grown together. So this Cliff Festival, as we do festival at home, we're excited to be part of the All We Can team again and to be bringing our digital fire pit, a place where we can gather around this fire as people have gathered for centuries to pray, to reflect, to tell stories and to share about our own discipleship and our own journey. We hope that you'll gather with us this festival at home. find me behind the desk uh, at reception at festival and this year of course we're unable to do that but I thought I would say hello anyway hope that you're all doing well I'm sad not to be able to see all the faces as people arrive answer all your questions make sure that your time at festival is an enjoyable one but hopefully you know what time dinner is going to be served and um, you know where your toilets are and you won't have to queue for showers if you're uh, watching from home this year so I hope that you are having a blessed time, you're encouraged by this time as festival at home. And uh, I also want to say a special hello uh, and a big miss you to Enid and Ivor as well. So enjoy the rest of festival at home and I'll be tuning in alongside you and hopefully we will catch up soon. Hello. I'm Becky. 
My name's Ben. I'm Nathan. I study maths and physics at Warwick University. I'm a student. I'm studying theology and youth work at um, Regents Bible College. I'm a uni student from Florida. I'm studying international business. So I'm doing this road trip with Nathan and Ben. We're travelling around the UK, we're meeting people from a whole different range of perspectives who um, are within the Methodist tradition. Talking about a range of challenging issues. I feel like we just don't chat about them in church enough. I've got these questions about what I believe. So anyone who's just looking to find out more, this should be really helpful. It's going to be one heck of a ride. My name's Tim Baker and I'm the Churches and Volunteers Manager at All We Can. It's been my privilege to be at Cliff Festival many times over the last few years, always in my role as part of the All We Can team. So it's been my pleasure to lead seminars and to have lots of really good conversations in the marketplace. And it's those conversations in the marketplace that will always be my endearing memories of Cliff Festival. Brilliant conversations about people's discipleship, about people's spiritual growth, times of prayer, times where we've learned and grown together. So this Cliff Festival, as we do festival at home, we're excited to be part of the All We Can team again and to be bringing our digital fire pit, a place where we can gather around this fire as people have gathered for centuries to pray, to reflect, to tell stories and to share about our own discipleship and our own journey. We hope that you'll gather with us this festival at home. Festival viewers. Our seminar speaker for this session is award-winning scholar activist Dr. Miguel de la Torre. Miguel has focused his academic career on the pursuit of social ethics within contemporary U.S. thought. He specifically looks at how religion affects racism, class, and gender oppression. Over the course of the weekend, Miguel will take us on a journey of hope, asking tough questions and giving us some even tougher answers. I introduce to you, Professor of Social Ethics and Latinx Studies at Iliff School of Theology in Denver, Colorado, Dr. Miguel de la Torre. Hello, my name is Miguel de la Torre. I am the Professor of Social Ethics and Latinx Studies at the Iliff School of Theology in the United States in Denver, Colorado. In the last session, we talked about embracing hopelessness. In this session, I want to speak a little bit about moving beyond hopelessness. And probably no story in the biblical text helps us to move beyond hopelessness than the story of the resurrection. Before the sun even rose, the first proclaimers of the gospel, women, made their way to the tomb. But when they got to the tomb, the stone was rolled away, and inside was an angel who asked them, why are you looking for the living among the dead? 
We celebrated Easter just a few weeks ago. And the symbol of the empty tomb is supposed to be a symbol of life and a symbol of hope. And yet, I have to ask, is our faith lifeless? Is our faith residing among the dead? You see, if faith is nothing but a mental acceptance of a way of life, then such a faith is better off dead. Dead faith usually reduces hope to unsustainable optimism, to religious platitudes, to, to jargon. How do we hope when we are walking in the midst of the valley of the shadow of death? You see, the reason why I embrace hopelessness is because the vast majority of the world's poor live in hopelessness. And if the liberation that I seek is tied to the solidarity with the poor, then I have no choice but to also sit in the dust and sit with them in the midst of their hopelessness. And where all that they know is the crucifixion and the blood and the gore of Friday, and may not even be able to, to have a glimmer of the possibility of a Sunday resurrection. How does one seek hope and new life literally among the dead? And I say literally. We are seeing thousands of people dying each day throughout the world. And, and this is nowhere close to being over. We could have hundreds of thousands dead by the time the pandemic passes, if not millions. Literally, this is our plague for our lifetime. And, and, and it's not just the plague that is bringing death. In, in Australia, wildfires are destroying Australia and burning it. Um, and, and, and there's also fires in Brazil that is destroying the environment. Um, we have uh, literally hundreds of billions of locusts that are um, devouring East Africa. Um, we could, we, most of us are finding safety within our home, within this little bubble as, as death is roaming outside our house. It is as if Mother Nature herself is rebelling over our failure to be good stewards of God's creation. So in the midst of death, when all is hopeless, how do we move beyond this hopelessness? And how do we begin to understand whatever hope is? I'm sure you all heard the pastor give the sermon in where he used the illustration of the little girl at the beach after a, a horrible storm that washed on the, on the shores all the starfish. And as she goes down the shore, she's throwing the starfishes back into the ocean. And as she does this, there's this grumpy old man sitting by the beachside who sees her and says, you can't save them all. And she picks up one and says, I'll make a difference in this one. And she throws it back. And, and if you haven't heard that, that little parable, um, I know it's very popular here in the United States, and I can't think of a church who hasn't recited it here. But here's the thing. Number one, I am that grumpy old man on the beach. You see, the stench of the rotting starfishes that, will, uh, that, that, that clogs my nostril has also choked out all hope in me. What we have done is that we have reduced hope to that one individual. And because that one individual could have hope, 
we could ignore all the other starfish that are rotting on the beach. I grew up in, 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 some, of the, in, in some of the worst barrios of New York City, um, a tenement building in where there was only one bathroom per floor shared with four other tenants' uh, apartments, um, where drugs and roaches and rats were all over the place, literally, um, and where a lot of the people my age at that time never made it out of the barrios, but are now six feet under. I made it out. I'm that one starfish who made it. And there was a temptation of putting this one starfish on a pedestal and praising God for blessing this one starfish and ignoring the vast majority of the population that in the hopelessness of their existence will only end in death. And I refuse to do this. Like I said, if liberation it begins with solidarity with the least of these, then I cannot just come in with all this hopeful jargon that ignores and dismisses what they are going through at this moment. I began to wrestle with the concept of hopelessness when I took a group of students to Cuenavaca, Mexico, to study at a um, Christian-based community. One of the things we did is that we went to the squad of villages outside the town to talk to the very poor um, about um, you know, their connection um, of their, the, I'm sorry, the connection of their poverty with first world privilege. Afterwards, I sat down with um, most of my white students to begin to unpack what they saw and, and, and what they witnessed. And I'll never forget one particular student looked at me and said, well, you know, I know it's horrible. It's so heartbreaking seeing how these people live. But when I looked into the eyes of the little girl, I saw the hope in her eyes. And, and at that moment, I had an epistemological meltdown uh, because I, my response somewhat crudely was, I'm not sure what you saw in her eyes, but within another five or six years, that little girl's gonna be turning tricks to put food on the table. Or if she's lucky, she'll be in an abusive marriage um, with a lot of kids that she still have to figure out how to put food on the table. You see, hope is a middle-class privilege that allows this student not to deal with the connection and the link of her privilege and their poverty but instead leave it in God's hands. God's in charge, God's in control. I have hope it's all gonna work out. I'm heading back to the United States. I never have to deal with this again. Hope becomes an excuse to do nothing. Hope becomes the most dangerous feeling because it maintains and sustain oppressive and repressive structures. I know that among the gifts of the spirits is love, joy, peace, and, um, and, and um, love, joy, peace, and hope, of course, and hope. Um, and here I'm saying that uh, hope needs to be rejected and we need to embrace the hopelessness if we dare to hope against hope. You see, using my own symbols, using my own language, in Spanish, hope comes from the word, well, in Spanish, the word hope is esperar, esperanza. Esperanza means hope, but it comes from the root word esperar, which means to wait. So every time in Spanish I say esperanza, hope, there is an element of waiting, but we're not sure what we're waiting for. It could be good, it could be bad. But you see, as long as hope could become irreducible to that one starfish, then I could definitely hope for the future. I mentioned, um, hope as a um, 
philosophy that I could have if I accept the linear progression of history. One of the individuals who does this is, is quite frankly, the, the prophet of hope, um, uh, Yugan Motman, who writes his book, A Theology of Hope. And, and part of his argument is that we can have hope because we know God will keep God's promises. And yet, I, I have to push back a little bit. I'm thinking of um, Primo Levi, the Italian Jew who was in Auschwitz. And he comes out of that experience saying, there is no God, only Auschwitz. And before I come to Primo Levi and say, oh no, all things work for good for those who are called according to God's purposes, which will sound somewhat trite, I have to sit in solidarity with the pain of Primo Levi who cried out to a God who promised the, it's the, the chosen people that God will always be their God, and yet God abandoned them. And many Christians may come up with all kinds of theological reasons why this happened. All of those reasons will fall short. All of those reasons are so Christocentric that they become offensive. I have to wrestle with the fact that Sometimes God does not keep God's promises. And what do you do when the God of liberation fails to liberate? How do I embrace what, Ecclesiast what, what, what the writer of Ecclesiastes said um, in the very first verse? Vanity of vanity, all is vanity, absolute fertility, everything is meaningless. I have to come to this realization that when I embrace Saturday, the hopelessness of Saturday, the radical solidarity with the oppressed, I am refusing the hope that domesticates. You see, hope has a way of preventing radical change. As long as I have something to lose, as long as there is um, something that I hold dear that I might um, actually um, forfeit, I will do nothing. Those who entered Auschwitz um, read a sign over the gate that said, work will set you free. That was a lie. Work did not set you free. But you see, if I read that, and if I could have enough hope that it is true, then maybe I wouldn't um, rebel. I'll keep my head down. I'll, 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 you know, I, I, won't, I won't look around. I, I won't make waves. I'll, I'll keep humbled. And maybe, just maybe, I might survive this. But as we know all too well, very few survived Auschwitz. Um, but by giving those crossing into that camp the hope that they may be set free by their work was enough to domesticate desperate people so that they did not rebel. I am more dangerous, you are more dangerous. We are all more dangerous when we have nothing to lose. I mentioned in the last session that I really am speaking to the marginalized, to the poor, to the disenfranchised, to the oppressed. As long as we have hope, we have something to lose. But when we have nothing to lose, that's when we'll take the radical risk of changing the structures that causes so much of the oppression the vast majority of our people find themselves in. And before we move on, there is one more 
theological concept that I have to wrestle with. One of the unexamined assumptions by Christians is, you know, God is good. And, and we say God is good and amen and hallelujah, and we don't think much about that. But that somehow becomes a little too simplistic. God's a lot more complex than simple um, dichotomies of good and evil. And let me explain what I mean. If, if, I'm, if I really read the biblical text, if I take the biblical text seriously, there's some passages there that causes me to pause. A um, very good one is, um, is Jesus on the cross, in where Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, good biblical scholars and theologians quickly try to save God from God and, and begins to give us theological jargon that Jesus was all sin at that moment and God can't look at sin, so God could not look at Jesus and therefore Jesus felt abandoned. Sounds nice, but I mean, really? God can't look at something because God is so offended that God can't handle seeing something? I, I mean, it's somewhat theological ludicrous. Um, if God can see all, and God is in all, and God is everywhere, how can all of a sudden God just be so, so, so offended that he can't look upon, or she cannot look upon sin? No, 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 no. Jesus felt abandoned and forsaken by God. Can't understand that, can't explain it, ain't going to try to explain it. But what that does is for all those among the margins of society who also feel totally abandoned by God, Jesus can relate. And, and, and the ultimate act of solidarity is being able to look at a Jesus who understands the hopelessness of being abandoned even by God. And again, no intentions of trying to theologically explain this away. We need to wrestle with the tension of that moment. Also, quite frankly, there was this understanding that um, God has a, a dark side. I mean, Isaiah um, tells us that if good or evil enters into a, a city, isn't that God who brings both good and evil? Um, think about that. God brings evil into a city as well as good. Or um, God sends evil spirits unto Saul. No, no, I only thought that Satan sends evil spirit. God sends evil spirits? I mean, again, I have no intention of trying to explain that, but I definitely am not going to explain it away. This God has a dark side that I think those of us who are Christian have beaten out of the biblical text. Many of my Jewish colleagues um, recognize that God is a little more complex than just simple good and evil, that God does have at times a dark side. Um, and, and, and I think this makes faith more complex and a lot more and a lot richer. And finally, and to, to, to prove this point, we have um, in the book of Job, you have a God who, who's gambling with Satan and basically says, I bet you I can make that good man over there, Job, curse me. Uh, no, I can't. Yes, you can. So they, they make a rager and God takes away all his health and his children and his goods and his riches. And, and, and for 50 chapters, Job is asking why. And the final answer that Job receives from God is, none of your business. I'm God. I do whatever I want to do. Not the type of answer I expect from God. In fact, this God comes off a little sadistic. Now, I'm giving these examples not to uh, dismiss God, but to say that maybe this faith that we are claiming to have has been so simplified 
that it lost its complexity. So to embrace hopelessness and move beyond hope becomes an act of dealing literally with the reality that was surrounded by death. And how do we maintain faith in the midst of death where easy theological and biblical answers will not suffice? And to that, we will move um, in the next section of our conversation.